Let's turn today to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22 and verse 47. This is referring to the time in the Garden of Gethsemane. While Jesus was still speaking with his disciples, whom he had just woken up from their sleep while he was praying himself, behold, a multitude came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was preceding them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were round him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And a certain one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. In Jesus' reaction to being betrayed by one whom he had loved and called to be his disciple and who had been with him for three and a half years, in Jesus' reaction to Judas Iscariot, we see the mark of a true Christian who has entered into the new covenant, that he has a loving attitude, believing that it is God who allows such a betrayal to take place. If we don't believe that, we shall be like the disciples who said, Lord, verse 49, shall we strike with the sword? Who are the ones who are ready to strike with the sword when somebody harms them or betrays them? Those who do not believe in the sovereignty of God. Those who do not believe that God is sovereign enough even to control whether somebody should harm you or betray you or not. In a parallel passage in John's Gospel, chapter 18, after Simon Peter had struck off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave, we read in John 18, verse 10 and 11, that Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into the sheep, the cup, which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Notice that. Not the cup which Judas Iscariot has given me. No, the Father had given it to Jesus. Judas Iscariot was only the mailman who brought the message. God uses many people to give us an education. We need to have enemies in the world, otherwise we won't know how to love our enemies. We need to have people who hate us, otherwise we won't know how to do good to those who hate us. We need to have those who will persecute us and despitefully use us, otherwise we'll never know how to pray for those who persecute us and despitefully use us. We need to have people who are evil to us and ungrateful to us, otherwise we'll never know what it is to be like our Heavenly Father, who is kind to those who are evil and ungrateful to Him. So we can say that God allows many things to happen in our life from our relatives, friends, neighbors, maybe from your boss in the office, from people around you, and even from the brothers and sisters in the church, in your own local fellowship. What is the purpose of all these things God allows in your life? To give you an education so that you can humble yourself, take up the cross, die to yourself, follow Jesus, and love in respond in response to hatred. So that's what we see here. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Another passage, he calls him friend. Yeah, that is the attitude of the Son of God. And we are called to follow him. Not to be like the disciples who were ready to strike with the sword. The disciples themselves changed after the day of Pentecost. And now as we receive the Holy Spirit too, guided by the Holy Spirit, our swords will be in sheathed, and we shall not seek to strike, but to respond in the way Jesus did, saying, Friend, the cup which my Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Here is where, in such situations, we discover whether we really want to follow Jesus or whether our Christianity is all mere theory and head knowledge. But we read another thing here, which is also very instructive. In verse 49, we read about the disciples asking the Lord, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And the thing we see here is they didn't wait for a reply. Before they got a reply, 
one of them took off the sword and struck off the right ear of the slave of the high priest. And that happens very often too with us. We can seek God for an adequate response to somebody's action and um, we don't wait for a reply. We want to act immediately. We don't wait upon God. Whenever anyone has treated you badly or harmed you or hurt you, wait on the Lord and ask Him how to respond. And His response will always be this. Put your sword back into your sheath. Forgive. Seventy times seven in a day. Forgive. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, etc. But if we don't wait for a reply, then we shall act according to our own reason and say we've got to defend ourselves. And then, of course, we shall strike with the sword, but we'll always find that Jesus seeks to heal the person whose ear we have cut off. That is his attitude. He will not support us. He says here in verse 51, Jesus said, stop. No more of this. Thank God they at least were willing to listen to him then to stop and didn't cut off anybody else's ears. And Jesus touched the ear of that man and healed him. Dear friends, this is Christianity. Nothing less than this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It's easy to appreciate these things when we hear a message like this. But it is only when you face such a situation that you know whether you really are willing to go this way or not. And so God will allow such situations in all of our lives. There's hardly a believer in the world who does not face such situations from people around him. And in that moment he must remember what he has read in scripture from this passage. And then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. Jesus knew why they were coming in the night, because they were afraid of the people. Their entire life was governed by seeking to please the people. One mark of a person who is not a servant of God, even if he's a religious Bible teacher or scribe, is that he seeks to please men. Galatians 1.10 says, If I seek to please men, I cannot be the servant of Christ. And these people were afraid of men. And that's why they never laid hands on Jesus in the temple. But he said, This hour in the power of darkness, verse 53, are yours. And having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. There's no doubt that Peter loved Jesus, without a shadow of doubt. He loved Jesus, but he did not realize his own weakness. And God had to allow Peter to be broken. To be broken by his failure in taking out a sword and swiping off somebody's ear. And also by his failure in denying the Lord three times. And it was after this brokenness only that he could become the mighty apostle that he became from the day of Pentecost onwards. God has to allow us also to face failure in our life. It's only when we have faced failure ourselves that we can be compassionate towards others who fail. Otherwise, we shall be hard upon them. That is why we, God allows us to fail like he allowed Peter to fail. But those failures must break us. The tragedy is many people who have failed in the past have forgotten their failure. They have forgotten their purification from their former sins, as Peter says in his second letter, chapter 1. Here we see the way in which the Lord broke Peter. God allowed these circumstance too. After they, verse 55, they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down. Peter was sitting among them, and a certain servant girl, seeing him and looking intently at him in the firelight, said, This man was with him too. And But Peter denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. In that moment, though he loved Jesus, the fear of man had gripped him. The fear of what other people would do to him. To preserve his own life, lest he also be led away to be crucified. And a little later, another saw him and said, You are one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after about one hour, he had one hour to think about the fact that he had denied the Lord twice already. And after one hour, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was with him, for he's a Galilean too. 
And Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. That is the weakness of the flesh. In the moment of temptation, we are not able to stand. Immediately while he was still speaking, a cock crowed. And here are these beautiful words. Verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What do you think the Lord was saying through his eyes to Peter at that time? Not, see, I told you so. No. It was Peter, I'm praying for you. And when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. I'm praying that your faith will not fail. And that's what broke Peter. The love and compassion that the Lord had towards him, even in his moment of failure. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him. Before a cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This was the preparation for his becoming that mighty apostle to the Jews. In six weeks from now, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he would not only confess Christ before servant girls and the servants of the high priest, he'd confess Christ before the high priest himself and all the priests as a bold person. But he had to be broken before. He had to see his own weakness. He had to see his own self-confidence and be shattered. And that is how God broke him. And he had to experience God's tremendous forgiving love. Even in his moment of failure. In the way the Lord turned and looked at him. A forgiving look. That's what we need to experience too. And when we experience that forgiving look from the Lord. We can turn a forgiving look towards others too.